Today we're reacting to TikTok art tutorials. That was a tongue twister. I feel like a legitimate YouTuber now. This like, is how you know you've made it. First on the chopping block. Absolutely overpowered painting hack. That's a big claim. Artists, watch this. That's right. This gray, when pulled out of context, becomes this muted orange color here. This is why color swatching a reference image digitally is a fantastic way to hijack the color mixing system. She's not wrong. It's like that viral dress. That was oh, like the blue gold. Yeah, white. is it gold and white or is it blue <laughs> yeah. and black? Yeah, yeah. I think this is where people who come from traditional art backgrounds have a great advantage because they're used to mixing the exact color they need. Yeah. Whereas people like us who do a lot more digital, we we kind of have the flexibility. Like we can paint everything according to local color and then just like put on the overlay and change all the colors. Yeah, here. that's what I do. So like this wouldn't yeah. help me at all with digital art. But mm. if I did want to try traditional art and I yeah. have to mix every single color that I use, mm. I think this is a really good tip. Oh yeah, I have so much respect for like traditional painters and they get they can mix like a gajillion colors and get the exact shade. Yeah, like if they're mixing like a green, they'll put a little bit of like magenta or like some other random color that yeah. makes no sense. But yeah. like that's how they get to the color. Like, yeah, I feel like if I wanted to get really good at color theory and stuff i should just like stop digital go purely traditional for like six months i don't know if it would be considered overpowered though yeah maybe maybe it'll help you like get a new perspective on art and color mm. but i don't think it would actually help you learn color theory better and learn how to best use your colors if you're just starting out and you've never really thought about the relativity of color and value my mind was blown the first time i, I realized that yeah. yeah or it's like if you've got like a gray circle on an orange background mm. it will look blue because the yeah. orange is like the opposite color yeah but if you put that same gray circle on a blue background it'll yeah. look orange you know? yeah exactly the lesson is that all color is a lie do we, do we stop at color everything color, is a lie everything's a lie everything that you see is a lie don't ever color pick your reference by color picking you rob yourself from the trial and error the learning and understanding of how color works we've got some conflicting what do you want from us i kind of agree with him i think i generally agree with that i do come from this sort of background mindset of like don't lean on color picking it becomes a crutch yeah but i think if you use it like you know just as as a learning tool mm. then okay. it is very helpful because you know, it does help to open up your mindset to realize just how different like your color perception can be i think it depends on the style you're going for as well like this guy has got like a really colorful like um almost impressionist sort of style yeah i think look generally speaking like anything in art there's nothing you should never do yeah like if you're starting from zero if you're an absolute beginner yeah and like all this color theory is just getting thrown at you you don't know like how to make head or tail of it yeah and so just to get you started i think color picking is good to just get the ball rolling mm. but beyond that you do want to train your eye to like look at a color like pick out that spot in a photo and go oh even though that looks blue it's actually uh closer to orange like if you if you were to color pick that yeah we can't be so vague we need to <laughs> have like more concrete Stricter. rules yeah in exactly. art you want yeah. concrete rules in art that's <laughs> <laughs> the only hard and fast rule in art is save regularly in Photoshop. This is called the 40% rule for the center of interest in your painting. Oh, I haven't, 40%. I haven't heard of this one. I know like rule of thirds, I know the 80-20 rule, which applies to like everything in the universe. I've never heard of anything being 40% 40 before. 40%, that's a very awkward number. Yeah. We're gonna talk about something called the 40% rule. So each one of these 10 values represents 10% to make 100%. At your center of interest, if you have a light, then you're gonna wanna be four value shades different from whatever the dark is to whatever the light is. Those will gradually wean and get closer together the further you back, the further back you go into the painting. This is a very like precise mathematical way of mm. doing value. I think it's a really helpful troubleshooting tool because sometimes like you go with your intuition and you just like hit a wall and you're like, something looks off about my piece and I'm not sure what. Yeah. So this would actually be a good way to think about it. It's very analytical yeah. when your intuition runs out. <laughs> but imagine doing that every time. Oh like, gosh, no, of course you not. You try a new no. value, like no. you, it would just take so long. Yeah. And I think what he's saying here, like for maybe um, more beginner artists who aren't quite clear on what he's saying, it's basically that to draw attention to the focal point of your painting, you need higher contrast, and that means so bigger differences in your values, so your darks and lights, bigger yeah. differences in your saturation and in your hue variation as well. Contrast always attracts the eye, whereas things that are a bit more muted, blurred out, um, your eye isn't comfortable resting on those spots, 
which is why you want things at the edges of your piece to have less contrast. Yeah. If you're painting a piece and you're feeling like, oh, the values are just weird for some reason, then just check whether you've got too little or too much contrast and whether your too little or too much is in like your focal point or in the, like the edges of your painting where you don't want the eye to focus. <laughs> Use this rule 40% of the time. Like with digital, we've got so much more flexibility and it's so much more forgiving that we can afford to mess around with our values because you can always, yeah. you know, uh, use uh, layers or curves and things and just like move things around. Yeah. When you're doing traditional though, and like I would love to hear from the traditional artists in the comments. It's very hard to, you know, spend two hours painting something and then go like, oh shoot, now I have to correct all my values. Yeah. So you, you want to plan a lot more going in. So I want to hear from the traditional artists whether you think this would be a helpful tool. Hi everyone, Insert Future Alicia. So if you don't know already, all of the insert artists here at Insert Art use Jazz's Ultimate Digital Brush Pack which is a collection of 83 incredible quality handcrafted brushes. They are fully compatible with Adobe Photoshop, Clip Studio Paint and Procreate. And it really comes with everything you need, including pencil brushes, ink brushes, oils, watercolors, special effects, things like rain and foliage and rocks and mountains, spatters, all kinds of textures, everything that you need to get started on your digital art journey. And all of the brushes are handcrafted by myself and Jazza. Now, if you've already got the brushes or you're looking for something a little bit more advanced, we also have a digital painting handbook, which is a 100 page deep dive into myself and Jazza's painting process. So if you wanna learn how to paint or draw like myself or Jazza, then check out the handbook as well. You can get a discount using the code insert brushes, so check out the link in the description below. Use a hair dryer to remove masking tape. Prevents ripping the paper. Oh my god, that looks like such a good tip. I hate masking tape. I've tried doing it with like watercolors and I always like rip a bit of the paper off as well. <laughs> like I don't know how people do it. Use conditioner to reshape brushes. My toxic trait is that I always leave brushes in the water and <laughs> like I that. take them out and they're like bent. <laughs> oh my god, I have to try this. This makes so much sense. Brushes are hair. Conditioner is for hair. Oh my god. I'm trying this as soon as I get home. This is so cool. <laughs> Your brushes will be like, oh. I'm gonna like shampoo them and condition <laughs> them and like give them a little hair mask. And a like... haircut. Hey, always photocopy your sketch for a backup. You'll have another in case you mess up. I don't know if I agree with that one. Like I, I always do it. I always take a photo of my sketch just in case I mess up. But I don't think that we should because I feel like it trains you to be super precious about your art. Yeah. And then true. like if something needs to be fixed or if something isn't quite right, mm. like you'll just leave it as it is and you won't actually learn. I think it's actually more beneficial to like do a sketch, mess it up and then have to sketch it again. Yeah, you learn better when you have no safety net. Um, that was a solid eight out of 10, I reckon. If you're just starting out, I think it's better to make 100 30 second sketches than it is to spend even more time on just one picture. By doing this for one hour a day, you'll have 100 chances to calibrate your sense of proportion and the nuances of the human form. Could not agree more. They taught me this in uni as well, like when we were doing life drawing. 10 out of 10. But like, obviously there are things that you're not gonna learn in that short period of time that you would you know, taking a piece to completion. Yeah, well, there's a time and a place for both. Mm. But if you're just studying and learning, like quantity mm. over quality. One time I took like this little sketchbook that I could, um, it was really narrow. So when you open it, it fits just nicely in the palm of your hand. So you can walk around all day oh, holding I love it. Those. Yeah. And I get a brush pen and I went to the zoo by myself to draw the animals. Now animals do not stay still for very long. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, now that giraffe is eating, I've probably got about 20 seconds before he moves. And yeah. you're just like, the, the mindset that you have going into an exercise like this is very, very important because yeah. if you try and rush it and try and capture everything in 30 seconds, um, you're not learning the way this is meant to. Yeah, in, like, you're not going to spend as much time observing what you're seeing. You're just going to draw what you think you see yeah. and then it's going to be wrong. Yeah, like the point of this is to make you distill the essence of a gesture. In your 30 seconds, how would you split that time up in terms of planning versus drawing? Or, or do you just like, the minute it, your timer starts, you're like straight to drawing? I would spend a lot of time looking at my subject and I always start with a gesture line, like direction of the spine, mm. I guess. And then I would go like to the shoulders and the hips and I'd literally just draw like 
lines, like mm. single lines, and it would look like a stick figure. Yeah. And you'd look at it and be like, this is not a professional artist drawing, this is literally a stick figure. Mm. And if I chose to continue drawing, and if I chose to spend 60 minutes on yeah. it, then the fun, like the foundation is there, and the foundation is really good, because mm. I spent the time looking at it, analyzing, and then drawing, rather than just like chicken scratching. A lot of beginners who might try this exercise, which just feel so intimidated by the time limit, the way to go about this is to have the right objective in mind and realize like what this exercise is trying to teach you and that it's not about making the prettiest sketch. It's just about training your eye to, to see the gesture underlying um, like a fully fleshed out human figure. Yeah, this is a gesture exercise. It's mm. not a rendering exercise. It's not a value exercise. It's not a color exercise. It's just gesture. And then once you've done these stick figures, then you can move on to form and start blocking out like the shape of the pelvis and the shape of the ribs and stuff like that. Mm. And then you can move on to like value and rendering and all of that stuff. And you can customize this exercise to focus on whatever you need to learn at that time. Yeah. The 30 seconds just makes your mind like have to hyper focus on that one aspect of learning. Yeah. 10 out of 10, Kevin. Nailed it. 30 out of 10. Oh, I feel like so guilty now about like all the days of my life that I've spent not doing this. To be honest, even though it takes 30 seconds, it takes a lot of like time to mentally get yourself into that headspace yeah, to be learning sure. properly. So I need to get into the zone, which is why probably why he recommends doing a lot of them. Like you don't have to commit to much. You yeah, can be like, true. if I just do one today, then that'll, mm. that'll be something, you know, then I'll be better than yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, so, you're, 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 even if you just do that one, you're that one drawing better than you were yesterday. Yeah, exactly. I thought for the most part they were pretty good. I, I, I'm too old for like TikTok, yeah. but I do like these like snappy quick tips. Let us know what you think are the best and worst um, tutorials or tips on TikTok or on shorts or just in general. Let us know in the comments. Or you can join our Discord and if you link us videos to react to, then we'll collect them and we'll do a whole nother video reacting to the videos that you sent us. Um, as much as I enjoy, you know, the rapid fire, like quick tips and stuff, and, you know, I enjoy making art, obviously. As an analytical person, I like getting into like a bit more of the contentious discussion around some of these concepts and these art rules. Yeah, the thing with TikTok is it's like very short form, so you don't yeah. get a lot of that depth. Mm. If you would like a bit more of that depth, um, please consider joining our Patreon. The link is in the description. If you join one of our Patreon tiers and you'll have access to our own personal tips and tutorials, where we go into far more depth um, about our processes and our ideas. It's not just creating art. It's not just having fun on camera. It's actually where we have those like personal um, engagements. You guys ask really good questions and sometimes we are here like kind of like figuring out these issues together. I, I really enjoy that. And our top tier on Patreon gets our masterclasses where myself and Ariel, we give you like personalized advice and feedback and you get to submit your artworks to us. And already we see like people like applying our feedback and we get so much positive feedback about our tutorials. Yeah, and I think there's a way you can grow as an artist when you're not just getting like the standard information and standard um, tutorials out there. It's when you have wrestled with a piece and you've come up with like a specific question and then you bring that and then like as a group we can discuss it. Like there's a level of learning there that you can't get anywhere else. Thank you, see you in the next video. Bye. Insert out.